Third party and independent candidates have every right to run for public office, but that's not what Democrats would have you believe. In fact, the DNC is gearing up for a fight, a sign of just how tight this election really is. Now, the DNC released its first ever ad campaign targeting a third party candidate, Jill Stein, the Green Party presidential nominee. She is portrayed as a spoiler candidate who only benefits former President Donald Trump. Let's watch. Jill Stein, Green Party candidate for president. So why are Trump's close allies helping her? Stein was key to Trump's 2016 wins in battleground states. She's not sorry she helped Trump win. That's why a vote for Stein is really a vote for Trump. Jill Stein, I like her very much. You know why? She takes 100% from them. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message. Meanwhile, there are rumors that Jill Stein is out there solely to siphon off voters who otherwise would vote Democratic. Maybe progressive journalist Mehdi Hassan said it best. Quote, to all the trolls in my replies today, answer me this. If it is so vital that Harris is defeated in order to stop the genocide and that there's no difference on Gaza, apparently between Trump and Harris, between the GOP and the Dems, why then do Benjamin Netanyahu and most Israelis want Trump to win and not Harris? Why did Itamar Ben-Gvir say they could do so much better under a Trump presidency? And why should I then ignore the clear desire and public intent of the people literally doing the genocide and listen instead to you? In fact, the DNC has created a team with seasoned political operatives. And to discuss this further, we have Ramsey Reed, who is a campaign, a campaign manager excuse me, at the DNC for independent and third party campaigns. Welcome to Rising, R Ramsey. Uh, I have a lot of questions for you, but let's just start with the lay of the land. How many states do we have third party uh, factors in, in terms of battleground states? How many um, states are we dealing with this issue? There are candidates, uh, independent and third party candidates on the ballot in all the battleground states. Okay. So uh, you, you solely focus on Jill Stein, but you know RFK was also a factor and you guys... Uh, the DNC notably fought him in New York, for instance. He's been fighting to stay on the ballot in New York. Why, why is there a play not just in battleground states, but also in other states? Is it going to affect down-ballot races as well? Well, I think what we've been focused on is holding these candidates accountable to the same rules that we have to play by. Um, and that we think that that's in the best interest of democracy. And uh, the real question to us you know, around ballot access has been why Republicans have been so interested in propping them up and helping them get on the ballot. We've seen Republican consultants helping Jill Stein and Cornell West with ballot access. We have seen uh, Jill Stein hire uh, Trump's former personal lawyer to represent her, Jay Sekulow. Um, a guy notably uh, who's chief counsel at ACLJ uh, that went uh, after protecting the Muslim ban. Um, he defended Trump in impeachment proceedings. So it's a real question to us uh, why Republicans are so focused on propping up these third party candidates. And it's one of the reasons that we've been so focused on holding them accountable to the same rules that we have to follow, that we have to follow. You, you point out that Democrats have made a big deal about democracy itself being on the ballot. Don't you think there's a fundamental tension with uh, taking active steps as the Democratic Party has or its acolytes have in states to keep uh, other candidates off the ballot? How, how is that not inconsistent with the idea that democracy itself is at stake? In fact, doesn't play into arguments that some would make that the Democratic Party is itself a, then a threat to democracy? Well, we haven't tried to keep anyone off the ballot. What we've tried to do is make sure that they're accountable to the rules. Um, and so when when what about RFK Jr. Started, in New York? What we, well, what we saw with with RFK Jr. Uh, generally was that he and Donald Trump shared the same largest donor that they uh, initiated an illegal ballot access scheme where he tried to have uh, Donald Trump's biggest donor put millions into a super PAC to pay for his ballot access, which is an illegal in-kind mm -hmm. contribution. And we pointed out, uh, pointed that out. Um, and what we also saw with RFK Jr. was this repeated uh, pattern of fraud and deception to try and get on the ballot, um, when in reality, he didn't actually have genuine grassroots support. He was just trying to use Donald Trump's top donor to put him on the ballot to try and hurt Kamala Harris. I mean, 
you, as a New Yorker, you make a good point. I mean, you have to get a certain number of signatures with valid voters to get on the ballot. And, you know, this was played out in the press extensively. And th the ties are, are undeniable. It, with Jill Stein in particular, I mean, what really concerns me as a progressive who sees her pop up every four years is just how she represents herself as this environmentalist, but someone who's actually worked in the environmental movement. Pretty much every environmental leader from Bill McKibben uh, onwards from, you know, the, the greatest environmental leaders say she has been nowhere in the movement. And yet she pops up every four years now with, with conservative Trump consultants and you have an issue in some of these battleground states where they're frustrated over very legitimate things. And, you know, and I understand in places like Michigan, um, the folks who are, are deciding to just not vote or are deciding to vote third party um, want to exercise their frustration over the situation in the Mideast. But can we talk a little bit about her ties with, I mean, th if you care about the Mideast, we also have to care about Syria. And there's this Assad tie that has been really concerning. And I think it's important to illustrate, if you're going to vote for, for somebody, we also have to understand who that person is. And I just don't feel like folks who are thinking about voting for Jill Stein really understand who this person is. No, Miki, I think that's a really good point. I think that she, you know, Jill Stein claims a moral high ground, but we have seen her repeatedly fail to call Assad a war criminal. Um, she has, you know, failed to denounce his actions. Um, and She's downplayed uh, the role that he had in the Syrian uprising. Um, I think she even called uh, questions uh, its legitimacy. She speculates that the deaths, deaths of thousands of people in Syria were a false flag operation. Um, but that's sort of this repeated pattern of behavior from Jill Stein. We see it with Vladimir Putin, where she also has dodged and evaded uh, opportunities to call Putin a war criminal. Um, she uses Kremlin talking points, uh, even while, you know, the Russians propped her up in 2016 and while they're actively, um, you know, attacking American democracy now. Well, she went to that dinner, that famous dinner. I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot of folks who have questions about Russia's influence, but it's undeniable that they have some influence in our elections. Um, but she went to that dinner famously at the RT dinner, which is part of Russian state media, uh, in Russia, sitting next to Mike Flynn and Vladimir Putin. I mean, that photo, which you can find online, was like, this person had no okay. experience in environmental movement, okay? And she's running as a Green Party person, and people who are in the environmental mo movement get frustrated with let her me, every four years for okay. using their let me get in here for a minute, though. to divide the election. You, 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 and, and I'm, <laughs> this is going to put me in a weird <laughs> position where I'm going to be defending Jill Stein, even though I'm not... I'm more I'm, I'm less left than even you two are uh, and I don't agree with her Syria policy or m maybe many other other uh, policies although I as someone who is very concerned about what's going on between Israel and the rest of the Middle East, I, I am glad that she's a voice for these issues. And I think it's absolutely fair to point out, as she does, that you know, she thinks what's going on is a genocide and a Democrats, Biden is facilitating it and Harris would facilitate it and Trump would facilitate it as well. That's, again, her argument, not mine. That's what she's saying. And thus, you shouldn't vote for any of those people. You should vote for her. And I think it's very weird to beat up on third party candidates who have tremendous um, uh, institutional systemic issues to get this ballot access. You know, you're you're going after them for how? Oh, well, they don't have real support. So I mean, it's difficult for them. The Democrats and Republicans are automatically on the ballot. And it's a winner-take-all system where the third-party candidates, even if RFK Jr. has five, ten, or fifteen percent of the of popular support in polls, he's going to he would end up with zero representation of the government because it's a winner-take-all system. Robbie, you can criticize candidates. Sorry to jump in here. You can criticize candidates. This isn't about the ballot access. This is about a candidate and her stances and her history. And people don't know enough about it, which is you know, why I wanted to talk with this 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 program in the DNC, because, you know, it's the first time I've ever seen folks actively call out her misrepresentations that other than activists on the side who've been angry for years. So, I mean, is this working with those voters? How are you able to sway voters who might be watching right now saying, I don't know if I should vote for Kamala Harris or I don't know if I should vote third party or stay home? What is your message to them? Well, I think it starts with 2016 where she campaigned um, on Trump and Clinton being the same, um, where she won 132,000 votes in the blue wall states. And that was more than Trump's margin, 77,000 votes total uh, that Trump's margin was in those three states. And then Trump was elected. She helped deliver him to the White House. And then she watched him try to implement the Muslim ban. She watched him appoint Supreme Court justices who overturned Roe v. Wade, who 
dismantled climate regulation. Uh, she watched him preside over um, horrific public health response, um, you know, telling people to inject bleach. Uh, and then she decided, great, sounds good, badge of honor. Uh, very happy to do it, happy to do it again. And so that's what's so disturbing. And so for us, we know that she has absolutely no path to victory. She's but, but not, she's not making president. an There's argument that you should vote for are... Donald Trump. She's making an argument you should vote for her. <laughs> What she's what she's saying is that Harris and Trump are the same and that you should vote for her. But what you see at her events are surrogates and endorsers who go out there and openly admit that she has no path to victory and that success for them is in stopping Kamala Harris. So when you couple that with the fact that she has no regret over her role in 2016, there's no other way to, to view this other than a vote for Jill Stein as a vote for Trump. And for, for us, we want to make sure that voters understand that when they are considering voting for Jill Stein, that they're voting for Trump. And if you want Donald Trump back in the White House, by all means, Jill Stein is, is a perfectly reasonable vote. But if you don't want Trump, then you can't take a risk voting for Jill Stein. And, and how is Donald Trump's policy different than Kamala Harris's policies when it comes to the Middle East? That is... This is incredibly important for folks, as, as we noted with Mehdi Hassan, who spoke about this. This is incredibly important for folks who are in battleground states that are frustrated with Middies. But I feel like we don't talk about that enough. How are they different? Well, I think Jared Kushner just the other day said he wants Netanyahu to finish the job in Gaza. Um, and, and Kamala Harris has been very clear. She wants an immediate ceasefire. She wants the hostages released. And she wants an end to the suffering in Gaza. And, and I think that that, you know, this question gets at something really important with Jill Stein, which is that she attacks Harris and she attacks Democrats relentlessly. She never attacks Donald Trump. That's just not true. We've interviewed her on this positions. show and she she had very unkind things to say about both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. And, you know, you, you could say that Kamala Harris has spoken out about the suffering of the people in Gaza, but Kamala Harris, unlike Donald Trump right now, is in a position to do something about it because she's a part of the administration. And the administration's policy has been to support and arm and send money to Israel no matter what, despite quibbling or disliking Netanyahu personally or not. The rhetoric, who cares about the rhetoric? The action has been in lockstep support. Um, and, and again, I'm not even speaking from my own perspective here. I'm just trying to represent why a, why, why a left-leaning or progressive person might say that Kamala Harris is unacceptable based on her attachment to the administration and what she supported, and thus we're going to vote for someone else. I mean, that's the argument the Green Party is making. This party is not, is not viable. It doesn't matter if it's viable or not. What their, their policies are inexcusable, and so you should vote for us. Robbie, I think it's pretty unquestionable that Jill, Jill Stein only has smoke for Democrats. If you look at her email program, you look at her events, you look at her remarks, she is overwhelmingly attacking Kamala Harris and attacking Democrats. And I think that is that really tells you what you need to know. Um, when you couple that with the fact that Donald Trump says, I like Jill Stein, she's one of my favorite politicians, she takes 100 percent from them. From them. When you couple that with the fact that she openly admits and willingly takes Republicans help with her ballot access, that she hires consultants who are at January 6th on the Capitol, uh, that, that were at the Capitol on January 6th, um, when she says that she would consider pardoning people uh, who are at the Capitol on January 6th, hmm. pardoning Trump, um, she, she pushes MAGA talking points. She downplays uh, a lot of the things that, you know, are really at risk in this election. Um, she was asked about Project 2025 and downplayed it as as propaganda. Um, and so I think it's pretty obvious that Jill Stein is in the race as a spoiler to help Trump. And that's what we want voters to know. And not to mention that her history of being anywhere in progressive politics is non-existent, which is something, you know, I'm very concerned about Jill Stein's Mideast policy because I don't know what it actually is. She might say things, but there is no plan, there's no record, there's no history, there's no complexity, and the record that we do have is that she has been dismissive of the war in Syria, questioning the chemical attacks in Syria, and I, I'm very concerned, and I think we have to think deeply about this, if you're going to vote for someone, know who it is. And, you know, I know where I'm voting, but for, for, for folks who are on the fence about voting for Kamala Harris for her positions, are you willing to jump in and vote for somebody who you don't know their real positions or history? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, do you see this working? Is it working so far? We're going to wrap right now, but um, just want to, how is the vibe on the ground? Is yeah, actually I, working? 
I I think we're not going to take anything for granted. We know what happened in 2016, and we are absolutely going to make sure that voters understand what the risks are, how close the election is, and that their vote counts. All right. Well, it could come down to a few votes, and uh, it's important to know who you're running against. And everybody has a right to run, but also everybody who's a candidate has a right to be challenged and have their legacy and history called out. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Appreciate you taking the heat. (laughs) Thanks, Nomiki. Thanks, Robbie.